Micronesia. Ranging far, sweeping wide, American warships venture deep into the Central Pacific. Bigger, faster, mightier carriers are the core of the task force destined to destroy the Japanese Empire. Around the carriers, the battleships are ringed. Around the battleships, the cruisers. Around the cruisers, destroyers. It is autumn, 1943. Radically new tactics are the United States Navy's answer to the challenge of World War II. The immediate targets are the Gilbert and Marshall Islands, scattered for 1,000 miles athwart the equator. Mandated to the Japanese in 1920, the islands are studded with enemy fortifications. Land-based planes cannot reach them. But the Navy's floating airfields audaciously sail into striking range and deliver the blows that lead to invasion, to conquest. Homing pigeons, the Hellcats and Corsairs return. Mission accomplished. Marcus Island has been worked over, but the flying sailors will be back. The carriers are nibbling at their prey, preparing for the kill. Pilots make their combat intelligence reports. This information is the blueprint for future assault. After hard-hitting months at sea, the task force returns to base, to Pearl Harbor. Eighteen months ago, the scene of the most humiliating military catastrophe in the history of the United States. Today, Pearl Harbor is the mightiest of bases, sheltering an ever-expanding fleet, ever-increasing assault forces. And only minutes away is Honolulu, a light-hearted haven in the midst of war an interlude for sailors between battles. come from places like Kansas, Alabama, and Oregon. They are destined for places like Tarawa, Kwajalein, and any we talk. The names are worlds apart, but global strategy demands they be brought together. Tokyo lies 4,000 miles westward by sea. It cannot be reached unless these men first suffer and bleed and die on intervening coral atolls that block the way. Admiral Spruance is named commander, Central Pacific Forces, by his chief, Admiral Nimitz. Under Spruance, powerful, fast carrier forces sail from Pearl Harbor to test the possibilities of sustaining seaborne air power far from base, far from land support. The fleet is out to strike, to strike and stay. The 
fast, new Essex-class carriers bring air power where air power is needed, anywhere, anytime. Each of the 27,000-ton ships can be driven through the water at a speed that keeps pace with the fastest units in the fleet. with death, the ship's company and the pilots live and play as best they can. For the 2,500 sailors, the ship is a seagoing city, organized for the routine of day-to-day -day existence, as well as the requirements of war. Micronesia, the tiny islands. Strategy for the coming conquest is explained to the men who must execute the plans. While Marines claw up the Solomon Islands in the South Pacific, while soldiers push northwestward on New Guinea in the Southwest Pacific, the carrier groups smash at enemy defenses in the Central Pacific, compelling him to split his forces, confusing him as to the main line of attack. The hour for action approaches. sailor in every part of the ship prepares for the coming attack. In the general mess, ship's cooks break out special chow they have stowed away for moments like this. Tense, long moments before battle. Kwajalein, and Eniwitok, and Majuro, and Roy, 
and at Namur, sailors prepare the way for soldiers and marines. Japanese resistance makes an inferno of every beachhead, a hell of every shoreline. American troops are pushed to the limit of endurance, but they endure. ships keep fighting ships at sea, in combat. Though hundreds of miles from Pearl Harbor, though thousands of miles from California, there is no lack of essential ammunition, food, materiel, fuel, to keep the enemy on the run, to give those in battle more than they need to fight their fight. Other carriers roam far afield to pound down such enemy bastions as truck, a formidable fleet anchorage in the Central Pacific, an island the Japanese have encrusted with armament, aircraft, pilots, and soldiers in their attempt to dominate Micronesia.
Squadron after squadron, group after group, the carriers hurl skyward young pilots who will help break the Japanese hold on the Central Pacific. Twelve fast carriers, 100 planes to every ship, fighting Hellcats, dive bombing Dauntless, Avengers armed with torpedoes, winged warcraft fill the sky. centers come the first warnings of counterattack, and all hands know the carriers will be the major targets. Radar data is swiftly translated into symbols and precisely plotted. The meaning of plot and symbol is all too clear, all too simple. Enemy planes approaching. carriers combat air patrol to intercept the attackers, beat them off, shoot them down. close support of the guy on the ground who is slugging it out with a rifle, a carbine, or perhaps a hand grenade, flamethrower, or bayonet. But it works. American soldiers, sailors, marines, airmen, as a team, crack, and then pulverize the Japanese and their defenses.
island after island falls, and the Japanese never give up until they die. But there are always a few survivors, too stunned to fight on, too broken to resist. the wounded and maimed. Back to the carriers come the shattered and crippled. ships and their sailors. The landing troops have destroyed the Japanese in the Central Pacific. They have profoundly altered the course of World War II. They have torn over 800,000 square miles of Pacific Ocean area from the enemy. Tarawa, Kwajalein, Eniwetok, war. Tarawa, Kwajalein, Eniwetok, Sacrifice. Tarawa. Kwajalein. Any we talk. Victory. ever sacred in our hearts, and that the sacrifice which they have offered for our country's cause may be acceptable in thy sight. plane in which he gave his life, that we might live. Into thy hands, O Lord, we commend the soul of thy servant departed, now called unto eternal rest, and we commit his body to the deep.